Right now I'm going to set up a file to share. We're going to go through the different permissions and restrictions that we're able to place on it. What you would do, you would go to the Windows Explorer, open that up, and here we have the file that I've previously created. We want to right click this file and open up the second menu. We go down to sharing, select sharing, and this opens up the file share properties. There are a number of different resources that are shared through the file share properties which would include file systems, printers, and databases. Right now we're currently going to work with the file systems. Usually it's a system administrator that sets the rights and permissions for the different resources. Okay, now what we're going to do, we're going to click the share this folder and automatically by default it creates a share file name which this one is file to share. It allows us to put a comment which could briefly describe what it is uh, is in that file that's going to be viewable on the network. Next we're allowed to set the user limit which basically sets the total amount of users that are allowed to access it. We can have different amounts here or we can just set the default which is the maximum allowed. Now we're going to get to the permissions. You have to remember that shares are created at the folder level. That's the FAT, the FAT32, or the NTFS level. Okay, I'm going to click the permissions button and we're going to open up another screen. So here um, we've, we see that there's three different permissions. We can have read, change, or full control. Once a file is shared, only the users with permissions are allowed to use it. Once again, remember that sharing a file means that you're making it available to users on the network. Okay, the read permission allows the user to display files and subfolders, execute programs contained in the directories. The change permission allows readers the same as the read permission, but also adds files, append or delete existing files or folders. Full control permission allows the same permissions as change and also includes change permissions and files and system resources. And up here where it says everyone, this just shows the group that we're setting the permissions for. In this, the add remove buttons we're able to add, which we will check it off here. This gives us a listing of all the groups and the users. We're able to add them and delete them as we need. I'm just going to add guests, OK. So now guests should be added into the share permissions. And what I'm going to do, I'm going to delete everyone by removing them. You have to remember that least restrictive will be the final effective permission when multiple sharing permissions are assigned. An example of this is if someone that has a user account only has read restrictions and if someone if that person is also a member of a group they and they have a change permission then the end result will be that they will have only a read permission allowed to their fo to their access to the folder. Okay, so I'm just going to apply the settings here and go back to the previous screen. So we, we've covered permissions, now we're going to cover caching. Caching is essentially to make the folder or file available offline. So I'm going to click the button here and we're going to be presented with a few choices here. We're going to go through them one by one. The default is to allow manual caching of documents. This means that the user must specify which file or documents that they want accessible. The second one is automatic caching of documents. This makes the files automatically cached and available offline. There is one note that uh, the files are only the ones that are selected will be made available offline. You must open the files for in order for this sharing permission to apply. Okay, we're going to check to the third one, which is automatic caching of programs. This is for files or folders that have read access only. They're ideal for read and referenced or run items. This is good for, to reduce network traffic. So what we're going to do, we're going to set it back to the original one, which was manual caching of documents, which is also the default. I'm just going to click OK. And this, then we would set apply and OK. And now we see a little hand that appears beside the folder 
meaning that it currently now is shared. The second way of creating a shared folder is using the shares in the computer management snap-in. What you do, you go to the start menu, start button, you press go to the run. Here you type in MMC, press enter, and this opens up the console one. From console one screen, you can op go onto the console button at the top left corner, press it, and click add remove snap in. From here you can choose which folder you're adding it in. We're going to add it into the console root. We add by pressing the add button. Now you highlight the computer management snap in, press add once again. This brings us to another screen which is the computer management screen. Here you choose from a local computer or another computer. Currently we're just going to use the local computer. If you're using a network computer, you got to make sure that you have the proper permissions set up on that computer to access it. So now we can go ahead and press finish. And now as, as we can see, we've added the computer management into the add remove snap-ins. We can close the add sta standalone snap-in screen. And we can also close this one here. So now we can see that um, on the console, on the root console, we've added computer management local. I'm just going to make it all a little bit bigger so we can see it better. We click the plus sign to open up this. I'm just going to open it a little bit more. Here we have to press the plus sign again to open up the system tools. Inside the system tools, we're going to find our shared folders. We can select this folder. And we'll see on the right-hand side that it displays the shares, the sessions, and the open files. You can click on the shares. This shows uh, what is shared on our computer currently. As we can see, the file to share that we created earlier is on here. By clicking the sessions, there aren't any sessions that are open right now, and there aren't any files that are open right now. So this gives us some control on how to view uh, what the settings on our system are. If we want to add a share into the share folders, what we would do, we would right click and we can add a new file share. We can have a new file share once again. So by right clicking it, new file to share, we're opening up a create share folder menu. Here we can either browse the file to find a folder to share. And here we have the share name and the description. So what we're going to do, we're going to browse the folder. So I'm going to open up, I'm going to select the file that I created earlier, which is called file to share. It's in the folder to share. And we can have a share name and we can have a description. I'm just going to type in something quickly here. Press next. Here we're given four choices of all users have full control, administrators have full control, other users have read-only access, administrators have full control, other users have no access, and customized share and folder permissions. It's very similar to what we just learned earlier about the share permissions. I'm just going to keep the default all users have full control and finish this up. Then it asks us if we would like to create another shared folder, which I'm not going to do so right now. And there it is. That's the folder that we've just created that we're going to be sharing. We're going to talk about assigning permissions. I'm going to go to the Start button, right-click it, open up the Windows Explorer. From here we'll be able to select our folder that we're going to be using. I'll go down. This is the folder that I created earlier. Go to the prop, right click it, go to the properties, open up the properties. We're going to select the security tab. From here, we're going to add in a user that's going to have, uh, we're going to be able to change the permissions for. There's the user I created earlier, temporary. I add him in there, press OK, and we're going to be able to see that he's added uh, to the folder. Okay, there he is. Okay, the defaults are read, ex read and execute, list folder contents, and read. 
The first one I'm going to be discussing is read, which allows the user to see the files and subfolders in a folder and view attributes, ownership, and permissions. Okay, the next one is write. This permission is going to allow the user to create new files and subfolders with the folder, change folder attributes, and view folder ownership and permission. The next one, the next permission is list folder contents. This one allows the user to see the names and files and subfolders in the folder itself. Oops, I pressed the wrong button. We're going to get to the access control settings later. The next one that I want to talk about is the read and execute permission. This permission, just check it off here, allows the user to list contents and even traverse. The ability to traverse folders is to access files and folders and their subdirectories. It even allows the user to access them even if he doesn't have the permission to do so. Next permission is to modify. This permission allows the user to delete the folder and it also gives us the user the same permissions as the read and execute and write actions. Okay, the last one is to allow the user to have full, full control. This permission allows, his, allows the user to change permissions, take ownership, delete subfolder and files, and gives the user all other permissions and actions that are allowed. For file permissions, it's very similar to the folder permissions. I'm just going to open up a file here and check the properties. And we're going to go to the security settings tab. And we're also going to add in a user, which we added into the folder there before. Temporary user. I'm going to add him in. Okay. And now we're going to set his permissions. The permissions are generally the same as they were with the folder, as I said earlier. The read allows a user to read a file, view file attributes, ownership, and permissions. The write allows the user to overwrite a file, change file attributes, and view file ownership and permissions. The read and execute gives the user the rights required to run applications and perform the actions permitted by the read permission. The modify gives the user the permission the ability to modify and delete a file, perform actions permitted by the write, read, and permit, execute permissions. The full control allows the user to change permissions, take ownership, delete subfolders and files, and perform the actions granted by all other permissions. Okay, now uh, to deny is the same for both folders and files. When you deny, you block the user from having using any other permissions that the user may have. Deny permission overrides all other permissions. Okay, now we're going to talk about the inheritance of permissions. The parent's permissions are inherited by all subfolders. See the way it's grayed out here in the allow? This means that it's inherited from the parent. Okay, when we uncheck the allow inheritance permissions from parent to propagate to this project, we're given a choice of either to copy, remove, or cancel. To copy, copy is inherited permissions from the parent folder. When you check off remove, it removes the inherited permissions and retains only permissions that were explicitly assigned, or you could just cancel and it will go back to being checked off. We're going to go into the advanced button features of the folder sharing or file sharing properties. Here we, under the permissions tab, we're able to either add or remove users. We can add one simply by pressing add. It lists off the users and we're just going to add a guest here. And after we're adding them, we to view which special permissions will be allowed for that user. Right now I'm just going to check off OK. What we're going to do, we're going to view the temporary user that was created earlier. The first one of the special permissions is Traverse Folder Execute File. By checking off Allow, this allows the user to move through folders and reach other files and folders. Next one only applies for folders, which is List Folder Read Data. And this permission allows the user to view file names and folder names within the folder. Next one, Read Attributes, either allows or denies 
the user to view attributes of the file or folder. The read extended attributes, by clicking this, you allow the user to read or view the extended attributes of a folder. The next one, create files or write data, allows the creating of files within the folder. Data permission allows or denies making changes to the file overwriting existing content. The next one, create folders, append folders, allows creating folders within a folder. And the append data allows changes to the end of a folder. The next one, write attributes, allows the changing the attributes of a file or folder. The next one, write extended attribute, allows changing the extended attributes of the file or folder. Okay, the next one, delete subfolders and files, allows the user to delete subfolders and files even if delete permission is not granted for the folder. Delete allows you to delete the files or folders. The read permission allows or denies the read permissions for the folder. The next one to change permissions is allows you not only to read the permissions but you're also able to change the permissions such as full control, read or write. Okay, the last one, take ownership, allows you to take ownership of the file or folder. The owner of the file or folder can always change permissions on it, regardless of any existing permissions that protect the file or folder. Okay, and then at the bottom, we're able to apply these permissions or objects to containers or within this container only. So I'm just going to check off OK and go back to this screen here. From this screen, we can click off owner to see the owner of the file So we're just going to go back to the permissions by pressing the permissions tab. Encryption services. Let's go to the start menu, open up the Windows Explorer once again. I'm going to select our file that we're going to use for this demonstration. Select the folder to share file. This is the same one that I created earlier. We're going to open up the, to the general tab, press the advanced key, and here we have a listing of advanced attributes. Windows uses an EFS system or encryption file system. Service is based on publicly private key inscription technology. It is managed by the Windows 2000 Public Key Infrastructure Services or PKI. When the owner of the file tries to access this uh, the file, the EFS system uses the pub private key in order to open up the file. If a user who does not own the resource attempts to access the resource they will be they will receive an access denied message to encrypt the file we simply press select encrypt uh, square here and we press OK and apply we're given a choice whether we want the changes to apply to this folder only or also to apply to subfolders and files so we're just gonna stick with the default apply changes to the folder only and it completes the process of encryption. And we can close the folder now. You can also go to the command prompt to do encryption. So we're just going to go quickly to the command prompt here and open up the, the window. And there's a utility called the Chiffer utility, and it allows you to encrypt files and folders as well as check encryption status. So I'm just going to type it in here. And this basically, for listing of the commands for the Chiffer utility, we press Chiffer backslash question mark, and this lists off the utility's uh, commands. We're going to talk a little bit about the print process. First of all, the user sets up print job by issuing a, the print command through the application. It is then sent to the printer software, which defines a path to the printer, sets up the print management process, which then locates the print server. The print server then processes the job, formats the job so the physical device can process it. From there, it is sent to the actual the physical printer, and from that device, it prints the job. Now, setting up a printer on your Windows 2000 Professional, you can go to the Start button, click it, you can either go to settings here, printers, we're just going to choose this path for now, go to the add printer icon, the next button, 
we have a choice either to set up a local printer or a network printer. Right now what we're going to do, we're going to set up a local printer. The process is very similar for also for the network printer. Normally it would find the plug and play printer, but I don't have a printer connected currently. So we, we pick an LPT port that we're going to use the printer from. Choose the printer device. If you have the disk, you could insert it, or you could choose it from the default setting, the default menu here. I'm just selecting them at random, and then it asks me the printer name, and do we want the printer as the default printer. So I'm going to just check off no, and I'm just going to keep the printer as the actual printer name next. And here it asks me whether I want to share the printer. So I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to share the printer as Brother H. Click Next again. This information is for other users that would be connecting to the printer on a network. So I'm just going to print in some information here. Okay, I'll type, sorry, front, office, the physical, the location to help guide the people, the users to where the printer is. And I'm just going to put a brief comment here. Press next again. Do you want to print a test page? I'm just going to keep it at no. And then it's the completed, completing wizard shows me what I've connected and how I've connected it. I can finish this and the computer or the system will copy the files necessary for the print device. And as you can see my printer is, is added and because the hand is below it it is shared we can right click on it to see the, the actual properties of it. This gives us all the properties of the printer including the sharing Remember before here is where the location and the comment. This is what people, what others, what other users will see over the network. Okay, now we can click, click off sharing, and as we can see, the printer is shared because it's a network printer, as Brother H, as we set it up earlier. We can add additional drivers to the system, which allow users that connect to the system. Maybe if they're not using the Windows 2000 platform, they're using Windows 90, 95 or 98 what we would do is we would add the driver here we would press OK and right now it's going to ask us for the disk to install so we're going to probably cancel this and we're just going to go ahead and take off the check mark but this this feature is good because it allows users that connect to the system to download drivers automatically from your own system so I'm just going to check off cancel here and we're going to go on to ports there's the different port settings which we can adjust. We can add ports, delete ports, and we can enable, um, we can configure the ports here. In the advanced features, we can select different times that we're going to make the, the printer available for the network users. We can set different priorities, priority levels. Here we can add a new driver for a printer if we're not satisfied with the current one. The print spooling documents or we can print directly to the printer and we've got a few other options here that we can use. Under the security tab it's very similar to the files and folders where we can add and remove users that are going to be able to use the printer and under the permissions we have three choices we can either print, manage printers or manage documents. So right now we're just going to check off print and we're going to go over what rights we have for that. So as a print permission we're able to print documents, pause, resume, restart, and cancel the user's own print jobs, so that would be our own print jobs, and connect to the shared printer. So these are the three options that this, this permission allows us. The next one that we're going to look at is to manage document. And this permission allows us the same permissions that the print permission allowed us, but also allows us control of the job setting for all print jobs, pause, resume, restart, and cancel all users print jobs and we're also able to cancel all print jobs. So by checking off the manage documents we're allowed to do this. And finally the manage printers which lets us have the right, the permit the same permissions as we did have with print and with the manage documents but we're also given a few other ones 
a few other capabilities such as we're able to pause and resume a printer and take a printer offline, share a printer, change printer priorities, delete a print, change sorry, change printer properties, delete a printer, and change printer permissions. By clicking the advanced button, we're able to see the same kind of configuration as we did with the file and folder sharing. We can see the permissions that are granted and we're also able to see the owner of the network printer. Here we can add, remove, and we can edit the different users. So I'll just ch check off one and we can see what uh, permissions we're allowed to have for this. And from here we're able to change the different permissions, print, manage printers, manage document, read permissions, change permissions, and take ownership. So we're just going to get out of this menu here and we're going to go back to one other feature about the print pooling which is under the port settings and if we check off here enable print pooling what this does is this enables our printer to be directed to multiple physical print locations this uh, option is good if you're using in a high volume print environment if we want to set up print redirection what we do is we're going to add a port you can see here that it says documents will print to the first free check port. So we're going to add another port, create a new port. I'm going to just call it computer for now. And OK. And close it. And here we've got a, a new port that we've created. So in turn, the computer will choose the print to. So this would be the port that the printer would be porting, uh, printing to. And if we connected it to another printer, then that would be the one that it would choose to print to. Adding and removing users and user accounts and group account management in Windows 2000. We would go over to the My Computer, right click it, select Manage, and this is also accomplished by selecting settings control panel opening up the control panel to the administrative screen selecting the administrative tools and we see here that we've also got an icon for a computer management so th this would open up the same uh, plugin as, as we we're just looking at earlier which is identical to the one that we opened up by right clicking my computer Windows, there's usually more than one way to get to any particular uh, window that you want to open up. So it is a good idea to keep in mind that there are different routes to uh, achieve the same goal. In order to view the different users and groups that are available, we can just un um, unclick the plus sign to a minus sign and we see we've got a listing of the different users and we've got a listing of the different groups that are available in the system. If we want to add a user, we're able to do so simply by right-clicking anywhere in the white area, the white part of the user screen. We simply select New User, and here we would just go ahead and add in the username. We can add in a full name, which is good for larger environments, and we've got a description. We have a choice of a password. It's recommended that you do use a password. And we are asked to confirm the password that we're entering in. We've got a few choices here where the user must change the password on the next login. If we uncheck that, we're able to see that we've got a few other choices here where we've got user cannot change password. This is given to maybe someone that you don't want to be able to have full access and changing different passwords, to changing their own password. And the other one we've got here is the password never expires. And if we want to temporarily just disable the account, we can simply just account is disabled and the user will no longer be able to log in under that password. And we just simply go to create. I'm just going to make sure the passwords are matching. Okay. 
and create. And what this does is this is creating a new user on the system. You can go ahead and close it and we see that this new user that we've just created has shown up here. Another way to create a new user is just selecting action from the snap-in, selecting new user, and we're brought to the exact same screen. If we want to edit any of the features of the user that we've created or any of the previous ones, we would simply select on top of it. We can select from the action menu, properties, we can delete, rename, we can set password, or we can right click onto it and we've got the exact same information as we did under action. Just going to simply select properties. We can see that we've got the name here, the description. We can add in as a different member of. So these are all the different groups that are available on the computer system now. We've got administrators group, uh, backup operators group, guests group, power users, replicator, and just the users group. And each one of these groups has a different set of permissions that are assigned to it. If we want to make this particular new user that we've created administrator, we could simply go to select administrators and simply select add. And we can go ahead and we can see that this particular one that we've just created is now a member of the administrators. We're also able to add in a profile. And if we had this set up, we could simply find the profile path and the login script for it. If we want to remove this particular uh, user, we can remove or we can add as the member of. So if we want to add and remove different groups from the user, we're able to do so. This is really a quick way to adjust the different rights. If I'm um, just going to cancel that, I'm going to go on to the groups. And we can create groups the same way that we create a user by simply selecting new group. Here we've got a new group name. We'll just call it something like sales. Sales depart. Department. And here we can add in different users that are going to be, that are going to be part of it. So I can add in this one that we've just created into the sales department. Create and then we're just going to go to close. And we can see that we've created um, a separate group here. If we go back to the users, we select properties, and we select member of, we can see that this particular user has now become a member of sales. And as what we were saying earlier, that uh, the use for groups, now I can quickly, I can um, set the different uh, permissions for this particular group when I'm assigning permissions and I could have it copied across a whole bunch of different users that are all members or part of the group. By default we've got an administrators group which has basically full power. We can see that it's a basic description here by default that it's got unrestricted access to the computer and the domain. We've got backup operators which um, can back up and restore folders and files. We've got guests, which have usually have limited rights to the system. We've got power users that have some administrative privileges, but not all. We've got a replicator here with um, directory application uh, replication when that's used. And we've just got your general users, and all new users are automatically added into this group. I'm going to go ahead and shut this down and we're going to talk a little bit about auditing now. We're going to talk a little bit about auditing. To enter into our auditing, we could go to Settings, Control Panel, and we see that we've got our administrative tools once again here in the Control Panel, and we select Local, local Security Policy. And this is going to open up our screen and we're going to be able to do our auditing here. And what auditing does, it enables the administrator to track user accounts and system events using the security log in the event viewer. So we, when we open this up here, see that we've got a few different settings that we can adjust here. 
the one we're going to talk about now is the password policy and this is going to open up our different password configuration that we're going to be able to work with and we're just going to open this one up here too we can see that we've got um, a bunch of different settings here that we're able to adjust as we need to we've got an, um, a policy called enforced password history which can keep up to 24 passwords and prevent using re reusing them and if we want to make adjustments we could simply right click it or we could select action and we could select security here we see that uh, this window when it opens up we've got uh, zero passwords are remembered do not keep password history and we've got zero passwords are remembered and if we want to keep a history we can add in the different passwords and have different passwords remembered here we've got the maximum password age this is how long the passwords are going to stay we've got the minimum password age and this is uh, when a password can be changed again we've got the minimum password length and characters so we can have up to a uh, maximum we can enter th that information here where we've got a minimum password link sometimes you don't want people to be setting their passwords with zero characters so you want to adjust that to uh, whatever your policy might be four characters five characters all depending on what you want to set your policy at here we've got the password must meet complexity requirements we've got it disabled and of course we've got a choice to enable it if we want to and over here we've got the account lockout policy and this is if you've got a user that's maybe trying to access your account that's not supposed to be accessing and this is a good way to kind of prevent someone from coming and trying a whole bunch of different passwords and getting in so if the if we've got this set here we've got the account lockout duration and this is the lockout after exceeding the logon attempt threshold so if we have a account lockout threshold and we're just going to open this up and we see that maybe you want someone only to have three attempts and after the third attempt you don't want them to be able to no longer enter in invalid passwords then the lockout duration takes effect and this is how long they have to wait before they can try re-entering the password again so here we've got account lockout threshold we can set it to maybe three for example and someone comes in they try to use a password the password comes up invalid three times the fourth time even if they've got the password right they're still gonna have to wait because they're gonna be locked out for whatever particular duration it is and here we've got the reset account lockout counter so this would just simply reset the account lockout next we've got the local policies and here we've got the actual audit policy itself here we're able to adjust our local policy settings our audit policies our user rights assignment and our security options depending on what in particular we want to do here we can simply even disable the control alt delete requirement for the login sometimes when you're logging into the system before the operating system starts it's going to ask you to press the control alt delete so if you want to disable it here you'd be able to do so we're just going to finish up by quickly talking about the MMC again which is a snap-in we're able to start from going to start typing in MMC and this is going to open up our console from the console here we're able to add remove snap-ins and we're just going to simply we're going to add it and remove it to this particular one so we select add and here we've got a whole list of different snap-ins that we're able to work with if we want to add one with the local users and groups we're able to add this one in here we're going to add it to the local computer to manage the local computer if we want to add in performance logs and alerts 
once again able to just simply add it in by selecting add and services and we're just going to use the local computer if we had a network computer we could actually manage it by using the local this computer and we could manage across the network and we could view different logs alerts depending on what the snap in is that we've added into it so I'm going to go ahead and close it and select OK and we see now that this particular console has these particular snap-ins and we can do what we were doing before when we created the my com when we right clicked the my computer and we went to manage we can see that this console we've got some of the similar um, similar snap-ins as in the computer management console this is uh, using the snap-ins it's kind of a good way to customize the different consoles and how how you want it you can afterwards you can save it or you can save it as and you can always have access to this particular console as you need to I'm not going to save it and I'm going to shut this part down here to access the Windows 2000 registry select start run type in reg edit and this opens up the Windows 2000 registry then we've got pretty much the same registry keys as we did in the other versions of Windows if you want we're gonna look through the control panel now and we're gonna go over some more information on the control panel a lot of it is the same as what you've seen before in the Windows 98 we've got the accessibility options we've got the add remove hardware add remove programs and we've got a new one here which is the administrative tools it's gonna go ahead and open that up and we see that we've got a few different icons here that uh, we might not have seen before we've got the computer management that we worked with before we've got the ODBC which is for to manage the database connectivity if you're setting up a database then you're gonna have to go through the ODBC we've got our event viewer which is just simply um, to see its uh, logs we've got different event logs and this is also where the security log and the application log are sitting we've got the local security policy which we looked at we're able to view our performance our systems performance and we've got a whole bunch of different performance logs and alerts here also in the system monitor we're able to adjust exactly what we want to see so we can add in new counters right clicking the empty area here and we can simply select whichever whichever counter we want we can select it for the local computer and um, our network computer so here I've got uh, a whole bunch of different counters I can select something like user time I can see all the different possible user times that I've had I can select cache add it and I've got an explain to explain the different information and we can see here now that the counter is the one that we've added in and it's um, the data map for hits percentage and for cache and we can also adjust the view of our counter we can view the different reports and the log file data we can save we can select it if we have it already saved we're just going to talk a little bit about the NTFS file system and the different permissions that are able to be set on it when it comes to NTFS we've got options for our file permissions and our uh, folder permissions we're just I've created uh, two simple one folder and one file here you can right click it to see the properties and we would go to security and we can see that we've got uh, under security we've got everybody and there we've got um, we're able to allow and deny depending on how we want to set it so we're able to allow and deny particular rights um, and permissions here we can have full control modify 
read and execute write and read and here we've got um, inherit permissions from the parent to propagate to this object if we don't want to allow the permissions to be inherited then we don't have to and we've got some advanced features here too where we've got can add in different permissions as we need to I can just set, select I'm going to select the temporary user that I selected before and we see that we've got a whole bunch of different permissions that we're able to allow and deny and we could just simply go through them and select whichever ones we want selecting allow or deny as we wanted to for auditing if we audit it we've got the same thing where we've got add in everybody and we're also able to allow and deny different permissions and it generally works the same way for your folder you can right click select properties select security and we see here that we've got a little um, the list folder contents which is uh, different from the folder from the file and we've got the same thing here where we can add and deny we can inherit the permissions and we've got the different permission auditing and we've got the owner of the file that's just some of the advantages of the NTFS file system that we are able to set the different permissions as we need to and configure it more precisely as we require them to be